I find me asking myself is why a calf? The Israelites had decided that they were too good for God. They thought they could do better. So they set about this designing a God of their own. And what did they come up with? A calf. Why not a ferocious lion, or a mighty giant, or a tentacled creature from outer space? If the best you can come up with is a calf, maybe you should just stick with God. We are influenced by things we watch on TV, by things we hear on the radio, by things we read on the web. The Israelites, too, were influenced by the culture around them. The stories they had heard about the Egyptian gods while they were slaves in Egypt. Maybe traders coming from Canaan, where they were heading to, with news of what was happening in that land that seemed so far off and so different from what they were coming from. And so maybe when we're asking this question, why a calf? We can look at the culture around them, the ancient Near Eastern culture, and see did calves have a special thing in their culture? And if you want to follow along in the handout there, I've listed some of the cultures we find in the ancient Near East, and you can write down you know, what they have thought on calves were. In the ancient Near East in general, the calf was seen as a symbol of power and fertility. As you remember from chapel yesterday, the Egyptians had a cow-headed goddess, Hathor, and because of their god Apis, they revered and pampered their bulls. Uh, going on in that area, uh, the Canaan area, which is where they were going to, which is what they knew as the Promised Land, there was an established calf cult. They based their religion around calves. The Mesopotamian moon god was named Sin. Yes, S-I-N, Sin. If the god that you worship is named Sin, maybe that should be a hint there for you. But um, the Mesopotamian moon god named Sin was represented by a calf. The Syrian storm god, Hadad, uh, we have lots of um, posts they have found in that area that picture him standing on the back of a bull. Making an idol is something the Israelites also learned from the, na the ancient Near Eastern culture, because it's something that was foreign to the Israelites themselves, because God had forbid the Israelites of making an image of him. That's even part of the Ten Commandments, is not to make an image even of God because he's indescribable, as we saw in chapel yesterday. In the ancient Near Eastern culture, it was thought that by making an image of a god, that you had brought that god under human control. And the Israelites wanted to be in control. We as humans want to be in control of our own lives, be in control of our surroundings. One of the reasons that Adam and Eve ate from the fruit is because they didn't want to be told what they couldn't do. Sometimes you want to feel like you're in charge, that you're in charge of your own life, that it's not God that's in charge. And do you know what that's called? Hint. It's the same as the name of the Mesopotamian moon god. God didn't tell the Israelites they couldn't make an image of him because he didn't want them to be close to him. It was quite the opposite. He knew that an image of them would make them think that he could control them, that would make them think that they could control him and would lead them into sin and sin would separate them from him. The golden calf that Aaron made for the Israelites probably wasn't made out of solid gold. It was probably either a wood or metal statue that was overlaid with gold. And we can put on a good show, but if you go below the surface, sometimes it's not what it appears to be. In the end, Moses destroyed the golden calf by burning it and scattering the remains in water. There's another God versus God tell, in this case, it's two little g-gods that are duking it out in ancient Near Eastern culture. And um, this story, uh, translated into English, goes, As the heart of a cow to her calf, as the heart of a ewe to her lamb, as the heart of a gnat, that's the first god, went out to Bel, she seized divine Mot, the second god. With a knife she spit, split him, with a fan she winnowed him, with a fire she burnt him, with a sieve she sifted him, on the steps she abandoned him, in the sea she sowed him. And so here we see one god burning another god and scattering them into the water. There's no evidence that this had any influence on how Moses reacted to this or vice versa, but it is an interesting parallel to see their similar stories at the same time <coughs> being written down. 
Now, while for the ancient Near Eastern culture, the calf was a sign of power and fertility, we see in the Bible that the calf ends up being, because of this incident and other incidents, a sign of apostasy. And apostasy, apostasy is when we turn our back to God and turn our back to our faith. And instead of calling this just God versus the golden calf, we could call this God versus the golden calves. Um, if you have your Bibles with you, you may want to turn to Exodus 32, and that's where they worship the golden calf at the amount of the foot at the Mount Sinai. But unfortunately, that's not the last time the Israelites worship a golden calf. Uh, later, a whole tribe of Israel, the tribe of Dan, decides to go off on their own and to worship a golden calf. And then even later, when Israel splits into two kingdoms, a northern and a southern, one entire kingdom decides to turn from God and to worship a golden calf. The story in Exodus 32 is after the ten plagues have happened, so the Israelites have been released from Egypt. They're out on their own, and they're at the foot of Mount Sinai. And starting at the first verse, it says, When the people saw that Moses was so long in coming down from the mountain, they gathered around Aaron and said, Come make us gods who will go before us. As for this fellow Moses who brought us up out of Egypt, we don't know what happened to him. That was their first mistake. It wasn't Moses who freed them from Egypt. It was God. They were putting their faith in a man when they should have been trusting in God. It's not your church or your pastor or your Sunday school teacher or your parent or grandparent who saved you. They may have showed you from God's word how you could be saved, but it was God who saved you. The people didn't understand why God was taking so long. Moses had gone up there and they were waiting for him to come back down and they thought it was high time that he should be down there. Yesterday I introduced the concept that the true God of Israel is indescribable. And all these other gods that we see, we can give a picture of what they look like. Maybe they look like a calf. Uh, but we can always describe them. But the true God is indescribable. But in addition to being indescribable, he's unexplainable. His ways aren't going to always make sense to us. The Israelites wanted a God they could see, that they could describe, and that they could understand. But if you understood everything about God... He wouldn't really be God. Going on with verse 2, it says, Aaron answered them, Take off the gold earrings that your wives, your sons, and your daughters are wearing, and bring them to me. So all the people took off their earrings and brought them to Aaron. God had already asked the people for their gold earlier in Exodus. The story of the golden calf is sandwiched between God giving instructions on how to build a tabernacle, a place for him to dwell in, and then later, them actually constructing the tabernacle. And earlier in Exodus, when God had asked for their goal, it was to be going into this dwelling place for him, into the tabernacle. And here they're giving their goal to make a likeness of another God, a God that they're inventing. God wanted to come down and dwell with his people, but they didn't want to wait for that. They wanted to pull down God right there with them, a God of their own making that they could understand. Going on with verse 5. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar in front of the calf and announced, Tomorrow there will be a festival to the Lord. So the next day the people rose early and sacrificed burnt offerings and presented fellowship offerings. After they sat down to eat and drink and got up to indulge in revelry. How short the Israelites' memory was. God had recently demonstrated his power with the ten plagues upon the Egyptians. But they weren't satisfied with what God had done. They wanted their needs, needs met right then. So that's why they had Aaron take their gold and make a golden calf so that they would have something in front of them they could see and understand right then. Moses was up on the mountain while all of this was happening, and he was talking with God. And God knew what was going on with the Israelites, and he told Moses. And God at this point told Moses, I'm just going to wipe them all out and restart. Moses, your kids will be the new um, nation of Israel that I'll create. Well, Moses pleaded with God, remember, you promised Abraham that promise. You would make his descendants a great nation. And so God decided to spare the Israelites, and Moses started down the mountain with two tablets. And we'll skip to verse 19, with Moses going down the mountain with the two tablets. When Moses approached the camp and saw the calf in the dancing, his anger burned, and he threw the tablets out of his hands, breaking them to pieces at the foot of the mountain. And he took the calf they had made and burned it in the fire. Then he ground it to powder, scattered it on the water, and made the Israelites drink it. I can't, 
imagine idle tastes very good. What kind of beverage would you like? I'll take the idle flavored energy drink, please. And then um, the end of the story there, starting in verse 25, Moses saw that the people were running wild, and that Aaron had let them get out of control, and so become a laughing stock to their enemies. So he stood at the entrance to the camp and said, Whoever is for the Lord, come to me. And all the Levites rallied to him. Then he said to them, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. Each man strap a sword to his side. Go back and forth through the camp from one end to the other, each killing his brother and friend and neighbor. The Levites did as Moses commanded. And that day about 3,000 of the people died. Then Moses said, You have been set apart to the Lord today, for you are against your own sons and brothers, and he blessed you this day. A passage like that is very hard to understand. And a lot of people have difficulties reading the Bible, especially the Old Testament, because of passages like that. But remember, we won't always understand God's ways. That's one of the mistakes the Israelites had made, thinking that they should be able to understand everything that God did. You'd think this would have been enough to teach the Israelites that they shouldn't follow a calf when they have this mighty God who had delivered them from Egypt with ten plagues. But still, um, they turned from God. And uh, you don't have to turn to Judges, um, because I'm just going to be reading one verse from Judges 18, and I'll kind of summarize the rest of the story. There were ups and downs between the story that we saw on Mount Sinai and when the people of Israel finally made it to Canaan, the Promised Land. It took much longer than expected, and if you're familiar with the story, you'll know what I mean by that. Now they're in the Promised Land, Canaan, but one of the tribes of Israel, the tribe of Dan, didn't have a place for their own in Canaan yet. So they decided they were going to go out and finally find a place that they could call their own. And they attacked a city called Laish, and they defeated the city. They totally wiped it out, and they rebuilt the city, and they renamed the city Dan after the name of their tribe. But instead of worshiping God in this city, and God probably even helped them conquer this city, they decided to set up an, set up an idol. The Bible doesn't tell us what this idol was, but Bible scholars say this idol was probably the golden calf that had been at Mount Sinai. Not the same one, but they made another golden calf like that. And they set that up to worship in this new town that they had made. And in Judges 18, verse 30, it says, There the Danites, which is the members of the tribe of Dan, set up for themselves the idol. And Jonathan, son of Gershom, the son of Moses, and his sons were priests for the tribe of Dan until the time of captivity of the land. It was Moses' brother, Aaron, who had made the golden calf, um, calf at the foot of Mount Sinai. And here it's Moses' grandson, because it says it was the son of Gershon, who was the son of Moses, you know, who was the priest for this golden calf. And the apostasy gets worse. We started with, you know, the Israelites fresh from Egypt. Here's one tribe, but eventually it's a whole kingdom, because... They go on to the promised land, David becomes king, they become a big kingdom, but then they have problems after David leaves, and the kingdom eventually splits into a northern and a southern kingdom. The northern kingdom was called Israel, and the southern kingdom was called Judah. Generally, the northern kingdom went their own way. They would worship other gods, they would follow the gods of the people around them, and generally the southern kingdom, Judah, tried to stay faithful to God. Eventually, both of these kingdoms became unfaithful, and were taken into captivity. And we'll be looking at a few more verses in 1 Kings, so you can flip over to 1 Kings chapter 12. And here, the kingdoms have been dis divided, and the first king of the northern kingdom, Israel, is named Jeroboam. And Jeroboam had a problem. The kingdoms were split now, but the temple was located in Jerusalem. And Jerusalem was located in Judah, which was the southern kingdom. And verses 27 and 28 of 1 Kings 12 say, If these people, and this is Jeroboam speaking, if these people go up to offer sacrifice at the temple of the Lord in Jerusalem, they will again give their allegiance to their Lord, Rehoboam, king of Judah. They will kill me and return to King Rehoboam. After seeking advice, the king made two golden calves. He said to the people, it is too much for you to go to Jerusalem. Here are your gods, Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. 
It's as if the Israelites had learned nothing. This is almost exactly what Aaron said in the golden calf he made, that this is the gods that had led you out of Egypt. If Jeroboam knew the words that Aaron used, you'd think he probably knew the outcome of that incident too. But he still chooses to set up false gods rather than honor the God who really did bring them out of the land of Egypt. He was the king. He had control. And sadly, maintaining that power is more important to him than serving God. And in verses 29 and 30 it says, Once he set up in Bethel and the other in Dan, and this thing became a sin. The people came to worship the one at Bethel and went as far to, as Dan to worship the other. So the two towns he put these two golden calves he had made was Bethel and Dan. And Dan, as you remember, was that town that had the golden calf when Dan separated to find their own city. So once again, there's a golden calf there that the Israelites are worshiping. Now, some think that Jeroboam had made these two golden calves to actually be idols of God. And even if that's true, God had told them not to make any images of him, not to make any idols of him, so they were still practicing idolatry because they were you know, worshiping idols that God had forbidden them to do. And in 2 Chronicles, which tells the same story, 2 Chronicles 13.9, it says, But didn't you drive out the priests of the Lord, the son of Aaron, and the Levites, and make priests of your own as the people of other lands do? Whoever comes to consecrate himself with a young bull and seven rams may become a priest of what are not gods. So even 1 Chronicles says, these two calves were not gods. The priests were priests of what was not really gods. So I began by asking, why a calf? And I think the psalmist in Psalms 106 asked the same question. And in Psalms 106, 19 and, um, 19 and 20, it says... At Horeb, they made a calf, and worshipped an idol cast from metal. They exchanged their glorious god for an image of a bull which eats grass. He seems kind of puzzled. Why would they exchange God for an image of a bull which eats grass? And if we look at some of the other verses in Psalms 106, God is so great that in verse 2, who can proclaim the mighty acts of the Lord? or fully declare his praise. We can't even name all the mightiest things that he did. You would rather exchange that for something that eats grass? Or the true God, in verse 8, rebuked the Red Sea, and it dried up. So he can you know, dry up the Red Sea so that the Israelites could pass. You'd rather exchange that for something that eats grass? So I want to ask you to ask yourself the question, why a calf? I know it seems silly. You don't worship a calf, and unless you're a farmer, you probably don't even own any calves. You may um, need to think about it for a moment, but at some time, you have traded God for something less valuable. You could have gone to church, but you decided to watch the game or go to the um, lake for the weekend. <coughs> You know God wouldn't have approved of the party that you went to last night, but if you hadn't gone, everyone else would have thought that you were weird. God has made you to serve others, but it's just so much easier to worry about yourself rather than to give any time to help others. So why would the Israelites worship an animal that eats grass instead of the God that sent the ten plagues to Egypt? Well, it's the same reason, you know, why would we trade God, the God who saved us by sending his son to die in anguish for us, for a weekend at the lake, or a fun time at a party, or just more time for ourselves? So why a calf? Well, um, if you follow along in your handout there, I have a few reasons I think that sometimes we choose the calf instead of God. We don't understand what God is doing in our lives, but God is faithful. One of the reasons the Israelites made the golden calf was because they didn't understand why it was taking Moses so long to come down from the mountain. It's not our responsibility to understand God's ways, but to trust God, even when we don't understand what he's doing in our lives, because God will be faithful. Another reason is because 
we are attracted to the right now, but God wants us to wait until the right time. We often make decisions based on what feels good right now. Sometimes when you ask God for something, though, the answer is wait. He has a better time. He has something better for you if you'll wait. And finally there, we are comfortable with the way things are. But God is angered by sin. Moses was angry when he saw the people worshiping the calf. Sin makes God angry. He was angry when he had first told Moses about it as well. And sin should also make you angry. And so just the end, I want you guys to take a little bit of time to think about and ask yourself right there that question, you know, why a cat? What are the times in your life where you've decided to choose something less valuable than God? 